All right. Well, good afternoon, friends. I keep thinking you must be in the wrong place, uh, but, and I'm, I'm really right now, my name is John, by the way, I'm a pastor and writer, I have this little ministry that I do, but right now I feel like, if you're a superhero fan, I feel like Ant-Man being invited into one of the Avengers, right? <laughs> So, uh, Captain America for today, I want to introduce you to uh, a new friend of mine, and uh, w we've traveled in similar circles, only recently met, and um, she is a writer, a minister, a blogger, a mom, a wife, an incredibly strong voice for beauty, love, and truth in the world. So, without further ado, Jen Hatmaker. That was nice. Hi. That was nice. Oh, hey, no problem. Thank so you. this is your first wild goose, right? Yes. So uh, tell me what you're experiencing, my friend. I'm going to borrow a phrase. Am I on here? Yes. Okay. I'm going to borrow a phrase that I just learned from my new friend. What you, would you say about it? I said it's beautifully bizarre. It's beautifully bizarre. Yeah. I'm like, yes, you nailed it. That is what it is. When, my, when people keep asking me, what do you think so far? And I'm like, it's wild and fun. Like, I don't know how to describe you delicious weirdos. But yeah. Um, I'm so delighted to be here, and I find myself in the wonderful fortune of being surrounded by people who are so like-minded in so many ways in which I have felt lonely. And so I'm just so thrilled to meet you. That's awesome. And yeah, this is what Wild Goose does. It shows the people who come here that they're not alone and they're not crazy, and if they are, in cra they are crazy, they're in good company, That's right? <laughs> So welcome. You know, Jen and I have been talking a little bit in advance of this time. We're going to touch on some things that are passionate, uh, that we're passionate about. But I wanted to begin, Jen, in case someone by some chance doesn't know you, I wanted you to give them the TV guide version of your life so far, the little blurb you would find in the story of Jen Hatmaker for everyone who's here. Okay. Uh, my family and I live in Austin, Texas. Some Texans. Love it. We have, um, my husband and I have been married 25 years this year. It's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I can't believe it. And we have five kids, and they're just, it's just so many. It's just so many. Um, I had the top three, like the way that you have them, like out of your body. And then our youngest two are adopted. They're Ethiopian. We adopted them when they were five and eight, and they're 12 and 15 now. Um, and so we have uh, one in middle, two in high school, and two in college. That's our family. Um, and I am, I'm a, I'm a writer. I started writing um, f almost 15 years ago when I didn't know two things. I literally am so happy none of you knew me back then. <laughs> Never ever go back and look at the archives. I, I forbid you to talk about it. I forbid it. Could security, could we security. Take, remove her? Get her out of here. All right. Um, and so I guess the soundbite, as it would pertain to this discussion we're about to have, is that I spent a, about a decade in really good favor um, with the sort of traditional evangelical church and did a good job of um, being their poster person. And then I um, didn't have that anymore and I um, aligned myself with the LGBTQ community and got um, kicked out of the family and then s miraculously, s shockingly and beautifully embraced by you people. And so, um, that was about a year and a half ago. So we're still rebuilding, to be honest with you. We're still, frankly, in some ways recovering. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of our life right now that still looks a little bit um, in transition and parts of our leadership that are morphing, but we'll get into it. So that is the soundbite um, of where we're at now. Fantastic. So a lot of what we've been talking about um, on the way here is the, the need for and the cost of authenticity in life and ministry. So I wanted you to begin by sharing some pivot points along your path. What were some seasons or events or people who really began to change the trajectory of your life and ministry? I'm glad that you asked that. And I'm looking for him because I think you told me, John, that he was going to be here. Is Shane here? Shane Claiborne? He, 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 he's... He was possibly going to pop it. Shane was really important to me about 13 years ago. Um, 13 years ago, out of left field, um, and we were in kind of a, we were in 
cool mega church. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and my husband was full-time staff. It was kind of chewing us up and spitting us out for dead, but you didn't get to say that. Um, and we had, we had little kids. We had not yet hit an adoption story. And somebody put into my hands the Irresistible Revolution, which I know a lot of you have read. And at the time, it was like it was a revelation for me. I had never heard anybody talk like that. I didn't know we could ask questions like that. I did not realize there was a Christian life that looked like that. Um, I had not been um, privy to such beautiful and whimsical advocacy. And it, it is not an exaggeration, exaggeration to say that changed my life. And so um, I found all his friends and cohorts. I found Brian and I found Tony and I found all of them. And um, privately, very, very privately, my, the, my grip on the threads of faith that I had very carefully woven for a couple of decades started to unravel. And um, I found myself all of a sudden in a context where I didn't know how to thrive anymore, and I was certainly alone. Um, and so that was a very, very pivotal spiritual season of upheaval. And then shortly thereafter, we left our cool church and we started a weird little organic missional hippie church. And we still pastor it to this day. And it has been the greatest joy of my adult life to be a part of this little church that is not cool. I mean, it is so Bush League, you guys. If you came, you would be like, is anybody in charge? Like, <laughs> put them through a workshop. Somebody help them. Um, and so... Um, that was super, super pivotal. And then if I had to point to maybe just two others quickly, um, it would have been, uh, I, I said this somewhere yesterday, w once you start pulling the threads of injustice, the whole mechanism comes undone, right? So for us, it started with the poor and God began opening a whole new drawer for us. You guys, we didn't have a drawer for the poor. We didn't know any poor people. Right At the time, we spent all of our waking hours um, serving saved people and blessing blessed people. Like, that's all I knew how to do. And so we started to have our eyes open for the poor. And then all of a sudden, when you see injustice somewhere, you see it everywhere. And so um, this began sort of a global story for us that has deeply changed our lives. We became super aware of the world in which... Um, like, I don't suggest becoming aware of the world unless you want to end up with two Ethiopians in your house, okay? Like, that's how that's going to happen. And fired. <laughs> and fired. Like, that's the end game there. So, um, and so we have these, we have this different looking family than I ever expected. And we start a, my husband and I started a foundation, so we give money all around the world. Um, and then the last big, huge pivot um, was when, again, that pesky unraveling injustice thread, it just will, don't start it if you're not willing to finish it. Um, because my head and heart started um, a, a sharp disagreement between what I had heard and seen in the church around the LGBTQ community and what my soul and my heart and my spirit were saying. And so for the, one of the first times in my life, I thought, I felt divorced from my own faith. I didn't know how to reconcile it. And so it began a, we began a deep, deep dive. Um, we thought this needs an, an investigation because I believe in Jesus and I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and I believe in the church. And if all the fruit that I am seeing, virtually all, is rotten, if, if this doctrine is so simply ending in broken hearts, broken lives, broken bodies, broken families, broken churches, self-harm, suicide, devastation, pain, that is bad fruit. And I don't believe it. That is not of God. And so... I started asking, where's the good fruit? And I found it in the fruit of the affirming Christian tree. And it was undeniably beautiful. I don't care who you are, you're a liar if you say that it is not beautiful. And I thought, oh, damn. You know, <laughs> damn it. This is not going to end well for me. Um, and so, but you know what? There's no other option. There's no other option. I will tell you that I stayed paralyzed just a beat too long, that I have a lot of regret and sorrow over and fear. I was afraid. I will not lie to you. I was so afraid. I had a lot to lose. And the Christian machine is very punitive. 
and I was very scared. Um, that took me about a minute to get over because you know what? At the end of the day, being unable to look at myself in the mirror, being unable to stand clean handed before God was worse. That was a worse punishment than fearing the evangelical machine. So yeah, now I'm on a lot of bad lists. So many, I can't count them. Yes, <laughs> and every, you're all on the same list. You are, I'm sure. Uh, yesterday I talked about somewhere there's a bizarre wild goose where they're talking about people like us. No doubt. And they're having prayer meetings uh, for <laughs> I us. I know. So, 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 Jen, you, you've been talking about this a little bit, but share the collateral damage of using your authentic voice. I'm sure it was a, a process that you had to soften at times or quiet that voice, but when you finally began speaking, I, you know, I talk a lot about turbulence in the work that we do, that shaking that comes when you disturb something. Tell me what that shaking, the actual hardest fallout has been of you using that authentic voice. What has been the surprising pain that's come out of there? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I was certainly prepared for that backlash. I'm not dumb, right? I've been around this game for a while. So I'd seen it chew up other people, and I knew the talking points. I knew the verses that would be lobbed. It's very, very predictable. Um, it's very, very repetitive in this when this conversation finds its way once again um, into this sort of Christian spotlight. And so uh, to some degree, I was we were deeply prepared, and we prepared ourselves for six months. We, um, we, we, we battened down the hatches. We did everything we could to minimize collateral damage. Um, we unhooked ourselves from a lot of partnerships, um, from a lot of events, um, n knowing that we would all go, they'd all go down with the ship. And so we tried as best we could to take it on ourselves. Um, but I, I think I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for, um, well, two things. I think the ferocity of it, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I often think I'm over it. I mostly am. It was so um, mean-spirited and hard. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, while, and while Jen's pausing, to see that out of people who claim to love Jesus, it, the disconnect is astounding, and so, yeah. And I think that was it. I think, like, that's, my, that's the family of God that we have served for two decades, and faithfully so and with love and joy and um just to sort of be i mean overnight and with no mercy kicked out it was devastating and um i think even harder was the pain close in like the internet is one thing right the internet is i don't even know what is it a dumpster fire i don't know what to say you know i there was a lot on the internet but there's a degree of separation between me and that. Um, close in, that was hard. And I know a lot of you understand what I'm saying. Your, your, your family, your friends, some of your church. We led our church also through an affirming process. So as you know, that was, we, there were losses. There were losses that were painful. And not all mean, we're taking our ball and going home. They hurt. Like people we loved and they loved us. And so there is a nuance in there to that sort of cost that isn't just all good and all bad or all mean and all kind hearted. It's, it's just messy and it was hard and it was hard for everybody. And so I think um, watching a lot of my friends suffer that were close to me, I did not expect that. Like if you knew me at all a year and a half ago, if you went to a college class with me once in 1994, you were put to the screws. Well, do you believe this? Are you on board with her? Everybody in my inner, middle, and outer circle got grilled over our experience. And so watching them all of a sudden have turmoil in their families, in their neighborhoods, in their churches, man, I would have done anything to take on that burden for them. And so um, there was definitely a cost, but I will say this. I have, and I mean this sincerely, 
I, I regret nothing. I wouldn't take a day back. I wouldn't take a word back. I wouldn't take a minute back. If I have any regrets at all, it is that it took me so long to courageously show up to the table. And I said this yesterday in the main session, and if you weren't there, I want you to hear me say it, particularly to those in the room that are um, in the LGBTQ community or their allies who love them. I want you to, I want to ask your forgiveness for taking too long to show up for you, for taking too long to stand beside you, to fight with you and for you, to march with you and for you. Um, I have a lot of sorrow over those lost years. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't struggle with you and love you well. Um, but I am here now, and now you'll never get rid of me. It's, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, Jen, talking about the pushback that you received, can you share a little bit of your insight onto how that pushback was different because you're a woman? And what has been your experience of that? Oh. All right, now. Gentlemen, or listen. Yeah. Um, my um, interpretation of that season was that it was incredibly gendered, um, that men in an evangelical limelight um, who maybe had a similar progression, um, who changed their mind, uh, who, who moved into an affirming space, were at least afforded a modicum of respect. Um, they, there, was, there was something about their body of work, their decades of ministry, that still um, were lauded as credible or useful or valuable. My experience was that immediately after so long of teaching the Bible, um, I was just called a lady blogger. I um, was called that HGTV lady. Um, I, I, I'd written 12 books. Those were notably absent from any article. Um, I was not a pastor any longer. I had not been a minister and a sister in Christ. Um, there was apparently nothing faithful to mention of my life. I was very much reduced as a silly, emotional girl lady, right? She's just thinking with her feelings. She's just got a big heart, bless her. You know, she just can't overcome her big heart. And so it felt very gendered, very condescending, um, very mean-spirited. And my, the people who hated me the worst were the reformed white guys. They hate me. Oh, my gosh. Um, and they came. They, came they, they have a little club, I guess. I don't know. They have, they have, a, a, they have a van. They dispatch it quickly. I think they do. They do. They have meetings. Woman they give each other out. language. Here's our talking points. Yeah. Um, and so um, that was discouraging. But now I see that more clearly. So I have my eyes peeled for that now. When women stand up in any way for any reason, with courage, with bravery, with um, an assertive voice, with conviction and clarity. Now I'm watching. Come at my sisters, do it. Like I, I am, I'm a defender now and I, um, I see that a woman's strong and clear voice is very powerful and very threatening. So that means girls in the room, we're just gonna have to work a little harder, but may we never give up heart. May we never lose the line. It's worth the tension, it's worth the work, it's worth the losses, and if not us, who? You referred to the person you were a couple years ago in the class. I want you to take yourself back to Jen Hatmaker 10 years ago. No. Uh, the, <laughs> We have the pictures, hold on, oh no. Um, where, what would you say to that younger version of yourself and how do you feel about, the, how do you think that person would feel about your theology, your spirituality now? Am I the only person in the room that it, your like 15 year ago self would call your today self a heretic, right? <laughs> what is that? Um, you know what, I've done a lot of work around this. Um, big fan of counseling. Um, and 
I have found that I've uh, learned to be more gentle and more generous and more gracious with my last self, um, with the three iterations ago, Jen. Um, because I will tell you this, and I think this is true, I was doing the best I knew how. You were too. You were too. I think we were doing the best we could do with what we knew and with what I had seen and with what I experienced. And, and that's hopeful for me because I think the 15 year from now, Jen, is going to be like, oh, rolling all her eyes at this, Jen, you know? <laughs> and so um, I just, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so uh, one way that I've parlayed that forward into my current life is that we have been very committed for the last decade to raise our kids a little different. Um, we can at least tr try to parent them now with what we know. Um, and so their exposure to the world has been vastly more expansive than ours was. Um, the conversations we put around our dinner table, we would have never darkened the doors of in my teen years, right? Like the people that we bring into our home, the, the questions that we entertain, the space that we make for doubt and questions. I had none of that. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. What, we, there is no common experience here, but I grew up kind of traditional Southern Baptist. So does that tell you everything you need to know? Um, okay. So, um, so we're trying to do the best we can with our kids now, but you know, a hundred percent in a decade, they're going to come back and tell us everything we did wrong. So whatever you guys just, we can't win. All right. Just have a beer. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, my son, my yeah. son tells me what I did wrong today. Right, right? totally. So I totally. hate the earlier version of myself, like five yeah. minutes ago. Right. Um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what, what I, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the people who are not here, the people that we're all thinking of, and I want you to talk about the process of change because you. 10 years ago, wouldn't have felt comfortable here, and how it relates to people who are not here, who we're all struggling with that process of they're not finished yet either. That's so good, John. I'm really, really glad that you said that because I'm just going to admit something to you. I was nervous to come to Wild Goose. Um, I was afraid a little bit of you, okay? Um, because there's just like there's a spectrum in anything. There's a there's a faith spectrum, and there's definitely a spectrum within progressive Christianity, right? And so there are some of you who have been doing this work for 35 years, and you're like, shut up, girl. You know, like, we've been there, done that. We paid the bills before you were born, you know? And so I, I know that. And, and it's true, and I honor so many people who held the torch before a bunch of us were brave enough to join the party, right? I honor that so much. It's also intimidating. It's intimidating to be a learner when you are surrounded by people who are 12 steps ahead of you. It's scary a little bit. And just like conservatives and fundamentalists can be mean as the devil, honestly, so can progressives, right? Really? <laughs> yes. I wasn't aware. So... As, as, as a bit of a newly minted one of you, <laughs> I hope that I will have the generosity to hang on to so much of the grace that has been shown me from this community. Um, when I said very, very dumb, dumb things out of this mouth, because I, I knew like just enough to be dangerous, right? I didn't have a body of knowledge yet. I was still learning. I had not been exposed to a lot of nuance in these conversations. And then I just spout off because Twitter lets you do that. Like nobody helps you not do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like I was shown a lot of generosity. And so I hope what we can do as a community that's very diverse, there's no one slice of the pie in the room, you know, we're kind of all over the place, um, is to dig deep enough to make a little bit of room for the people that just showed up, right? The ones who like are full of questions, they're asking inappropriate, even rude things because they don't know better. Um, they're talking too much because they haven't learned to be listener. Um, and yet, there's so much hope for them. We don't know what kind of powerful ally and advocate they may be in four years, right? We don't know what sort of space they will fill that we have no access to. Um, or what sort of good brother or sister they're going to turn out to be. Maybe they won't be such a dumb dumb after all. You know what I mean? And so um, I, I hope that's the place. I will tell you that has been my, the majority of my experience, sort of crossing over, if you will. Um, it has been kind. It has been welcoming. 
Um, I've had very dear friends in this community sort of pull me aside and be like, that thing you said. No, don't. We don't say that. And, and right at the so, and at the time, your your instinct is to, to defend why you said that thing or why. Oh, that thing listen, was defensiveness is my first language. Okay, <laughs> so yes, it, it takes a great deal of humility to change your mind, to change your tribe, um, to change your theology, um, to change your space, your leadership. Um, in my case, to change a whole lot of partnerships. Um, and so I hope that I will always be humble in it, always, and I hope that I will always be a good big sister and a good um, soft place to land for people who are brave enough to say, I'm asking some new questions. Because um, I remember how scary that is and how lonely. So I hope in us they find a good home, right? That we're good neighbors and that we're good brothers and sisters and they're glad they left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. As you're sharing, we're talking about like faith deconstruction and some of that. And to some degree, we've had insulation because that being a public figure, you have people who are going to rally around you. But a lot of people here, I don't know if you know that political climate is really strange in America what? right now. The, the Wi-Fi is bad here, so you may not have heard. Um, but I want, I want you to speak to the people who are feeling a profound sense of isolation, disorientation in their faith communities or in their own families and circles. And what, would, what advice would you give them? What words would you give them about the struggles they're experiencing that are not public and there's not people there to boister them? I have so much compassion. So, so much. I'm public and a lot of my things are public, but I know what private suffering looks like too. Like I had that too. I had this stuff that nobody ever saw with like my dad, right? And my uncle and P beloved people in our church. That was all private and under the radar, and it was so close and painful. And so, I, first of all, I, you can count on me to pray for you in your pain. I promise you that I already do it, and I will continue to do it. I know that place feels lonely, and frankly, it feels scary. I don't know if I'm the only one that was afraid, but it just feels terrifying, like you're losing your mooring, you're, you're losing your people. Um, in my case, I feel like I was losing respect, and that matters to me. Like, that's what I have. I have, credi I have spiritual credibility as a leader, and so to feel like I'm grabbing on to what's the losing the tail of all that was just so terrifying, and, um, and so I have so much deep empathy for that. I, I would say a handful of things kept me uh, courageous, sane, and on the path. And one of it was community. And if, if you can find, and it's worth the work, whatever it takes you to do the searching, the looking, the digging, if you can even find the smallest little community where you actually live, people that you can touch with your hands, um, people that will come to your house and bring you a cappuccino, right? Somebody that's live in flesh and blood, even if it's one person, that's enough of a lifeline um, to keep your, your feet on the course. Um, and so I had some real life people with whom we sat around and they listened to me cry for six months. They never gave up on me. And then the good news is, um, while the internet does have its fair share of like Russian spies. Most of my followers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Probably mine. It's, again, I'm it's, surprised there are this many people here. Right. <laughs> it's a weird time. Um, it can also be a really healing place of community. A bunch of people in this room were my online community, and it counted. It, it's not less than. It doesn't. It's not fake. Um, there is some. There is an underside to online community for sure. Um, but my online friends who had gone before me, who even were with me in transition, um, what a lifeline! I, I honestly can't imagine where I'd be today without them. And so. Um, you're not alone. You may feel alone, but you're not alone. So you, nobody will do this work for you. You have to go find it. And it's so important that you do it that I just feel like bossing you. Like, yeah. I feel like bossing you and making you sign a paper as you leave. I will do the work. Um, and so that, that'll see you through. And then I don't know how else to say this, but Jesus saw me through. Um, this is his fault. I'm serious. 
This is his freaking fault. And um, I want that, I really want to say this to encourage some of you who have been fighting this fight for a long time by yourself or with a really small tribe or a bunch of evangelicals fight against you. I, um, I want to tell you that somebody that's on your side is apparently Jesus because it was in the depths of my heart and soul in my very real life faith, the one that was active and living and moving where this seed was planted. It was there and I couldn't escape it. This deep seed of conviction, of deep confusion around what I was hearing versus what I was seeing. Um, that was Holy Spirit movement. And so let us not grow weary in doing good because the Holy Spirit is moving right now. He is, he is, he is active. And so we get to hear this because we have a little bit of a public life. And so if you could only hear how many leaders and pastors are whispering in our ears right now behind their hand, we are asking these questions. We are concerned about this too. I have big doubts about this. I'm studying this, but as, as they know, and they are right, they will lose their jobs. They will lose their churches. They will lose their ministries. The cost is high, but they're weighing it. And I want you to know that God is leading them to weigh it. And so I have a lot of hope for this next, next decade. I do. I think God is drawing in allies and faithful believers who love him deeply and love their neighbor. And I cannot wait to see where we're at in 10 years. I really can't. And so um, be encouraged that God is on the move. This is not just a bunch of wild goose hippies on, on the loose. Do you know what I mean? Like God is at work here. Beautiful. Um, so Mike Iaconelli, some people may know, a hero of mine, he quoted a guy, a friend of his who said, I know, a guy, I know a guy who got straight A's in school and flunked life. And I want you to share with everyone here, what does passing life look like? What is, what is the best way to live for you right now? How does that look? Hmm. That's a hard question. Um, so I, I think about this a lot. You know, just, I'm halfway through my life. I'm going to be 44 next month, right? So I, I'm half in the bag here. Um, and so you don't know I that's not true. That could be true. Right? Yeah, you don't know my life. Um, not your business. It's not. I think, I think what I'd love, what I'd love, when I'm 95, when I'm 95 years old, this makes me want to cry. Like, I, I want to be able to look back on my whole life with my kids around me, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, and I want to be able to say, I did everything God asked of me to whatever cost, and I love people well. Like, if that is all that's left of me, no one's going to remember any of us in 100 years, right? This is, the, this is it. This is our one moment in history. It's all we get. These are the only days we get. If I could say... I was on the right side of that. I was on the right side of that too. Um, I stood with, I stood with people who were harmed. You know, I stood with people who were hated, um, who were kicked out, um, who were lonely. Um, and when God told me go to them, I went. That's all I can do. That's really all I want. That's it. Like I know very well, you guys. Whatever success or whatever the heck. I have, or I've been granted, it can be gone in a flash. I watch people who love me so much, you're my favorite person, walk out the door in 10 seconds. Kind of easy come, easy go, right? Fame is stupid. It's not even real. It's, it's not. It's not even real. It's fickle. Um, it has no substance at all. It has no merit, and it has no eternity. So I don't care. I don't care. Um, tomorrow, if I just decide that for a living I'm going to drive a boat, I'm doing it. Okay, um, and so um, I just want to know, I want to know that I was faithful, that I was obedient, and that if anybody knew me at any point in their life, they'd be like, Gosh, she liked me. <laughs> she really, she loved us well. That'd be it. That's, that's good life. Very good, very good, yes. All right, so I want to do a one minute lightning round with Jen, then we're going to have some questions. So lightning round is this, Jen. Um, binge show recently. Shit's Creek. Okay. Uh, guilty pleasure. Rascal Flats. I'm sorry. Okay? I'm sorry. Well. Don't come at me. Jesus may not judge you, but. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, what's your go-to comfort food? Wine. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and you could have lunch with any living person. Who would it be in? Why would you do that? Michelle Obama. It's too easy. Yeah, that's right. I love her. And your, uh, your, the first celebrity crush you can remember. Ricky Schroeder. Uh. <laughs> Do you remember him? He, Silver Spoon? Yeah. Okay. She's coveting all your bracelets. You say he remembers. Ricky used to wear those. So who has some questions? How are we going to do this? I think we have a microphone that can be passed. Um, do we? Or was I lying? All right. Microphone. Get a hand up. Okay. We'll start with one in the back. Oh, wait. You got to go second. And we have a few minutes, but Jen and I decided we're coming during this for six hours, so just <laughs> get comfortable. Thank you so much. Complete respect. Um, I am especially curious, because I have two young children, how this shift has affected um, you as a parent, you've talked a little bit about how you're trying to parent differently than you were 10 years ago. And I know you have a church home that you're in charge of, so you're not in danger of your kids losing their church. But um, I think there might be other people in the room, like myself, who aren't in that same situation. And I'm curious. Sorry. It's, That's okay. It can be really scary to think that when you're unmoored, you're bringing your kids, you know, to a place where the lifelines aren't attached anymore. And I'm curious how you've handled that with your parenting. You're a good mom. <laughs> You're a good mom. It's true. I want to sugarcoat this for you. I do. Like, I'm wanting to make this easier and sound smoother. But the truth is, you're right. There's a cost, and sometimes the cost is with the whole family. Um, my kids have the added disadvantage of having a public mom. Super weird. Um, and so... This is what I would tell you. Kind of like I want my 95-year-old self to be proud of me. I want my kids to be grown-ups and look back. You know what? Having something hard in their childhood is not the worst thing. It's not. It's not the worst thing. Pain in a childhood is not the worst thing. It has a lot to teach them. And they have a lot of growth. It teaches us our best, one of our best teachers. So first of all, we cannot fear everything hard for our kids. Second of all, what's your kid going to say about that when they're 45? You know what they're going to say? My mom was kick ass. You know, they are. They are. They're going to say, they're going to say, my mom did the right thing. My mom stood on the right side. And there was loss to it. But guess what you don't know yet? You will find a community, a faith community for you and your family that is so gorgeous, so expansive, so full of good fruit and love and joy. You will never believe that you were afraid of it for one second. And so march on through the fear, through the pain. And I promise you, on the other end of it, you are going to be so proud and so grateful. And so will your kids. I know. Um, so first of all, I want to say to you that there are so many amazing, loving, kick-ass churches that would love to have your family. That's true. So if you live in D.C., you can come to mine. Yay. Um, secondly, I would like to ask you, Jen, um, so for those of us, as I know is true for you, have um, super religiously conservative members of the family. In my case, it's my youngest brother and his six homeschooled kids and daughter who married at 17, etc. cetera. Um, and um, I am just curious how our family has decided, my mom and I made the choice that we would rather have relationship than be right. Okay. Beautiful. And, um, and yet it's weird because we're family and we don't talk about it at all. So I'm just wondering if, I, I'm wondering how you handle it. And John, I'd love to know how you handle it, honestly. You want to take this one? Well, for me, what I try to remember, uh, two things. There are, there are seasons when I can fight that fight, when, I'm, when I have the energy or the disposition or the purity of heart to, to deal with that person. And there are seasons when I know I need to step away. Uh, and so that's a delicate balance. There are some days I feel strong enough to deal with Aunt Rita, and there are some days that I don't. Um, but the other thing is, 
sometimes that withdrawal is important because the, 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 when you place yourself outside of that, sometimes it's self-preservation. Um, so it's knowing when to fight for the relationship and when to fight for your own sanity because there are days when you have to make a choice. Um, and, but it's important to remember right now for me to remember I, I can't ascribe motive to anyone in that okay. situation. I can try to show them the result of the person they support or the legislation they support and, and then, or a story and give them the responsibility to act in compassion. But I can't tell them why they feel the way they feel. Wait, we have a, we have one over here that has we've he's been she did. Thank you. How many more are there like you that are stirred through this process in the last few years that are coming from a more conservative, intolerant perspective? When you look at the national numbers or movements, there's got to be more like you, please. That's cute. <laughs> That's cute. Smooth. Smooth. <laughs> I gotta write that one down. I suspect a lot. I do. I, I suspect a lot. I think that what we see in the public conversation, it maybe feels like 10% extreme on one side and 10% extreme on the other, but I think that 80% in the middle is far more nuanced asking a lot more questions, not as like dogmatic and dug in, and um, they need permission. And, and I think that's why it matters, like it matters that we use our voices. I mean, sometimes we're like, well, Jen, it doesn't, I'm not, you've got a whole thing going on, like people are listening to you. Yeah, but you know what, people are listening to you too. And so when you say in your world, in your social media feeds, um, around your tables, in your churches, to your neighbors, to your Aunt Linda, when you just say words out loud, like, um, this, is, this is my theology, this is how I'm learning, this is, these are the questions I'm asking, um, these are the, this is a leader I'm listening to, this is a book I'm reading, do not underestimate what that does. I think what it does is inject permission into our cultures for our friends and our neighbors and our and our church communities to do likewise really it's not small it's not small we really can't actually count on a handful of like semi-famous Christian leaders to do it that's dumb we what, what do we know you know um, I, it's it's, it's going to be us I think it's going to be this groundswell of faithful believers on the ground um, who are just courageous enough to say what's true um, to say it out loud, to say it to their brother sometimes who doesn't agree, to say it in love, to say it with grace, to say it with intelligence. Like, know what you're talking about. You know, back it up. Um, and I just, I can't tell you how many people did that around me that had no idea the effect it had on me. I can't tell you how many, I'm sitting quietly listening to somebody else say these things out loud and I'm going home wrestling it out. I'm going home with a new prayer on my lips. I'm going home to read a new book, to listen to a new, it mattered to me, it mattered to me. So let's not disparage our own influence and how impactful it actually is. Yeah, yeah, if I could just follow up on that, it's so good because you know, I, I happened a few years ago, wrote a blog post called If I Have Gay Children, and it, and it goes viral, and the next day I'm on CNN, and underneath it said, John Pavlovitz, pastor. But what it should have said was, unemployed and currently despondent. <laughs> and because I, I didn't have any platform, I didn't have any uh, organization behind me, I had simple words that were deep within me, and I shared them. And so the power of your story and your voice cannot be overstated. So please use that. Hello. Hi. Um, I just had this conversation, um, and I'm glad that I did. Um, and this is my fifth year at the Goose, but this is my first year as an author doing a presentation. I know you weren't there, but yesterday I did a presentation with Brian McLaren, and I wrote a book. And for me, it's that I wrote this book. I have a message. Um, it resonates with a lot of people, a lot of prominent people, but I'm not affiliated with a church. I don't have a major endorsement for someone. I think this book is important. Very important people also believe the book is important. Uh, 
I'm a heretic's heretic, and I'm just wondering how do I even get my voice heard beyond here, and what? how do I figure out what God is calling me to do in terms of what's the next step? Because people do need to heal, hear my message. My message is a message of love and healing, and I wanted to get it out there, but I totally what what I need to do from here, because I don't want it to end here, and I don't know some more encouragement of what I need to do. Yeah, uh, I think the idea is this present moment that you have, what is the wisest, boldest, most courageous decision you can make, and you make it, and you trust that it will lead to the next one, because uh, Jen can tell you, or in my experience, I wouldn't have planned this, I couldn't have planned this, it would have been a bad plan, yeah. right? <laughs> get something, get fired so that something good can happen. Yay. So I'd say just be, just have joy and be as present as you can in the moment and trust that that will lead you where you need to be. It's really that simple. It really is. What's your book? Like his book. Yeah, what's yeah. your book? What's Todd got to do with it? What's Todd got to do with it? Is that, oh, God. I, I thought it was like this really cool, like, oh, Todd. In Todd, we trust. Okay, so, so. We've got we've got one minute, and Jen, I want to give you that minute to say whatever you feel you want to leave Wild Goose with in this time. Okay. Uh, I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all the kindness that you have shown me. Um, for every sort of sad, like ugly rejection I had, I had 25 wide open embraces and I'll never forget it as long as I live and it was a deep and important part of my own healing and my own progression and so I want to thank so many of you for reaching out and just saying something so simple like we're still here like we're still here with you you're not by yourself I can't tell you how powerful that was to me at a time when I felt like I was burning alone on an island um, just to know that a bunch of other people were on the island with me um, putting out the flames on my behalf. So, so, so special. Thank you for that. Thank you for um, your encouragement to me. Thank you for sharing your stories with me. I've heard a lot of your stories since I've been here. And I just, I go to bed with your, your names on my, on my lips. And so you're very precious to me. And I hope to be a really good sister to you for the rest of my life. Beautiful. All right, Jen, thank you. Wild Goose, you guys have a great day. We love you.